Colossians, chapter number one, the book of Colossians, chapter one. Colossae is a little town not far from Laodicea. If you go to Colossae today, all you'll find is a hill and some ruins. There's no church there, but 2,000 years ago, there was a powerful, vibrant church that the apostle wrote this letter to that had some faithful members. But when he wrote the book of Colossians, it stands in as separate from so many of the New Testament books in the sense that there's no other book in the New Testament that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ more than the book of Colossians. It's a powerful book. So the apostle says in Colossians chapter number one, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Father, bless your word now. And bless it to the hearing of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. We have every reason to believe the Apostle Paul did not go to Colossae. He did not establish this church. The Apostle Paul was a church builder, believe me. He went from one place to the next, establishing the church. But what we have here in verse number 7 tells us that Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ, Epaphras had a direct hand in establishing this church, the church at Colossae. He's a church builder, a church establisher. That's one of the greatest ministries there is, folks, is to go out and start a church where there is no work, not build on another man's foundation. The Apostle Paul warned them plainly, we don't build on another man's foundation. We don't go take his members from him and build our church. That's not the way you do it. You go where Christ is not preached. You go in an area where you need to, to get the word of God out. And there, start a church. Start one. Build it. You wouldn't believe how many areas in this country, folks, have no churches. These folks are coming here to Temple Baptist Church from all over the country because there's no churches where they live. And the church needs to be established. A preacher called by the grace of God to preach his word goes out and he rents a storefront or he, he uses his house or something like that and he starts a church. That's a wonderful ministry. That's a wonderful ministry. Somebody said one time that most of the preachers in the country are in Florida. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> nice and warm down there, you know. That's just a joke, folks. You can laugh. <laughs> down in Florida. But the truth of the matter is, so many preachers have the idea that they, their ministry is limited to what goes on inside a building. And this building is simply a place where we study and we pray and we fellowship and we prepare to go out and carry the word of God and carry it out to those who need to hear it. So Epaphras, Epaphras is the one along with another who started this church at Colossae. And it's a wonderful thing too. Here's the things I want you to see about it tonight. I want you to notice that the book of Colossians gives you the identity of Christ. Verse number 15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things consist. Verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Then in chapter number two and verse number three, the scripture says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now remember, the apostle is identifying Christ to the church at Colossae. Verse nine, chapter two, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Then in chapter number three and verse number four, when Christ who is our life, 
shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. This is akin to what the Apostle John says in 1 John 3 when he says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so the Apostle Paul said it in a different way, but he said the same thing. He said, Christ is our life. In other words, that's who we are. That's where we are. The Bible said, my life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. We're already seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You say, how can you be here and there at the same time? You please give me tonight. The, you, you tell me what the, the, the essence of a spirit is, and I'll tell you how that you can be there and here at the same time. You can't. Nobody can. Nobody's ever bothered to try to tell me what the essence of a spirit is. Do you know why? You're smart. Because nobody knows. Because to break down the essence of a spirit is to break down the essence of Almighty God. For He is pure spirit being. John chapter number 4, the Lord said to the woman of Samaria, God is a spirit. So being born again, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My fellowship or my my conversation is in heavenly places and my life is hid with Christ in God and Christ is my life. Therefore, there is absolutely nothing on this earth that sustains my life. The only thing that, that is sustained on this earth is the flesh. And from the earth it came and to the earth it shall return. But the life that is in me is from above and it's the life of God himself. Now that's what the Bible identifies Christ as. And then it tells you what he's done. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 13 said, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I wish I could get every drug addict in the country to understand that they don't have to give up hope, that they can be delivered from that horrible addiction to drugs. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. Now, most of the Baptists kicked me out of their churches for saying that. But I'm going to tell you something. There's power in that name. And the name of Jesus, you can be delivered. There's nothing. There is no sin, no bondage, nothing that the power of Christ cannot break. So the Bible said he delivered us. Look at verse number 16. The Bible said, for by him were all things created. He's the creator. Notice carefully in verse number 17. And then, no, I'm, jumped ahead, I'm going back again. Verse 20. Look at verse number 20. Here's what he has done. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now I want you to notice what goes on here. We, he has made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given forth an olive branch to a guilty sinner and said, I have offered you complete forgiveness and salvation. Just accept it. That's what this is about. And he was in Christ reconciling the elect unto himself. Amen? No, that's not what the Bible says. What does it say? God was in Christ reconciling the Baptist unto himself. No, the world. Every living, breathing human being on the face of this earth. He was in Christ reconciling them unto himself. Aren't you glad for that? Yes. You'll be surprised, folks, how some churches will exclude you. You'll be surprised at how some... There, there are churches that meet in this town right now that you will never be invited to. And unless you are born into those churches, you will never go to those churches. How many of you knew that? Now, what kind of an outfit is that? Think about that for a moment. Meditate on that for a moment. Let that sink in for a moment. There are those who separate themselves, like the Amish and others like that. I can respect a lot of things that they do. But have you ever had an Amish man hand you a tract? Have you ever had one try to witness to you to get you saved? You see what I'm saying? 
It is, the, it is the responsibility and privilege of the church of God to get his word out and to witness to men and women, whoever they are. So the Bible says he hath made peace. Look at verse 21. And you that sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Two times in two verses, be reconciled. Now what is a reconciliation? Have you ever fallen out with a good friend? Have you ever had words of, of, you know, that you felt bad about later, regretted saying them? And then you felt awful bad about it, and then I don't know which one initiated it, but one or the other, maybe both of you at the same time, said, I don't like this. We've been friends all of our life. i got to do something about this. Let's, let's, as the old saying is, bury the hatchet, and let's be friends again. That's reconciliation. That's bringing back together again. Two that had been together before. He hath reconciled at the cross of Christ. There's a message there going forth to the world. Then the Bible says in chapter number 2 and verse number 11, this is what he's done. Now this is what he's done. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is a spiritual circumcision that cuts the soul free from the body, and none of the Old Testament saints had that happen, and this circumcision allows your soul to be free from the bondage of the body and the death of the body, and being set free from it, then you are able, by the grace of God, for the Holy Spirit to energize your spirit and give you the victory that only comes from the Spirit of God. And thanks be unto God, this is what he's done. Chapter number 2 and verse number 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, that means made alive, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances against, you, against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This is what he's done. Now here's what we are to do. Go back to chapter number 1 and verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. That will tell you more about yourself than anything else I can think of. You can be so theologically correct. You can be so straight-laced. It ain't funny. <laughs> but you don't have any thankfulness in your heart. And if you don't have thankfulness in your heart, you're not right with God. I'm not saying you're not saved, and I'm not saying you won't go to heaven, but I'm saying you cannot walk in the Spirit, you can't have the power of God in your life, and you can't walk in fellowship with the Lord. You've got to be able to be thankful. Unthankful characterizes this generation. The opposite of an entitlement. People feel like they're entitled. They're entitled. The only thing I was entitled for was hell. Then God saved me. And man was, am I thankful? I am so thankful. I am so thankful. I looked at this lady today on the, on the news media, and she had her babies around her and had her husband, and she was weeping. Her house had been burned to the ground. And she said, I'm going to tell you something we can build again. But she said, I've got my family. I am so thankful. That's when you realize we're value. That's where your priorities come in. That's when you understand what means something. She said she's thankful. Chapter number 2 and verse number 6. Here's what we are to do. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye in him. Notice that walk. See that? That's a progressive thing. Continuous thing. A continuing thing. Walk in the Lord. If you walk in the light, John says in 1 John, as he is in the light, you have koinonia with each other, fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is cleansing you from all sin. Cleanses a continuous, progressive thing. Walking in fellowship means that you're being cleansed of your sins. Hallelujah. I mean, what more could you ask for than that? Walk. The Bible said, to, when the Lord spoke to Abram, he said, in Genesis, I think it's uh, 14, 15, somewhere in there. He said, Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. The word perfect there doesn't mean 
sinless. Nowhere in the Bible does it say any man's ever sinless, but the one that was sinless, the Lord Jesus, he was sinless. All the rest of us got a problem with sin. And the Lord said to Abraham, he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. What's that mean? Mature and complete. And the only way a man will ever be mature and complete is to get a hold of God and find out who he is. He wants to walk with you. He sought Adam in the cool of the day. There's nothing greater on this earth than to walk with the Lord. I encourage you. If you're not walking with him, start walking with him again. So the apostle told the church at Colossae, walk with him. Chapter number 3 and verses 1 and 2. This is what we are to do. Now look at this. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, if you are going to be raised with him, or if you then be. Which one have we got here? This is an accomplished thing. See? If ye then be risen, you've already been raised with him. See? <coughs> Seek those things which are above. Chapter number 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above. So the apostle says to seek and to set. That's what he wants you to do. Seek that which is above and set your affections on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. In other words, get yourself in a situation where that's what you're thinking about a lot of the time. It's what's going on in heaven. That's where we're headed, you know. Don't want it to be too, 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 too big a shock for you when you cross over to the other side. Surely you won't wake up one day and say, where am I? Surely you know where you're going. Amen. The apostle said to be absent from the body is to be buried in the ground, right? No. Be present with the Lord. <laughs> Look at chapter number three and verse number five. Look at this word now. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What's that? That's the body. You see, put it to death. He didn't say put your spirit to death. He didn't say put your soul to death. But he said put your body to death. In other words, the fleshly nature. Mortify it. Well, he, why didn't he say clean it up? Why didn't he say purify it? Why didn't he say kind of get it in line? No, 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 no. The only thing you can do with the flesh is do away with it. That's right. Bring it into subjection. I mean, it's a separate study entirely when it comes to flesh. What's that for? There is no good thing in my flesh. That includes my fleshly brain. Amen. I don't know about you, but I got a problem with my flesh, fleshly brain. Bothers me. <laughs> yeah, it does. Bothers me. You say, when the preacher, I've passed that point. I've been sanctified for 35 years. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I'll get around you. Well, maybe rub off on me. I need something. All right. Ch chapter number three and verse number eight. The Bible says, now ye also put off all these. Look at verse number nine. Chapter, uh, chapter number eight and verse, chapter number three and verse 12. Put on. In chapter number three, per, verse nine, put off. Chapter number 12, put on. Take something off, put something on. And what follows is the list of all that goes along with putting off. And what follows is what comes with putting on. But here's where the key is to all of this. It is the thinking of the mind. Your greatest battle will be fought right here, folks, in the mind. And it is the mind that must be renewed. That's right. What does that imply? It implies the fact that you must constantly guard your mind. You've got to deal with that mind. The mind must be renewed. How do you renew it? Read the Bible. Pray. Seek the face of God. Set your affections on things above. See, not on things on the earth. Think about the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Uh, listen to good Christian music. Sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Get your mind involved with spiritual, eternal, holy things. And that will help set you apart. Keep your mind constantly engaged with that. And I know you got to work. I know your hands are involved in, uh, in doing things. You know, some, I was reading the other day about some of the old carpenters and mechanics and and uh, bricklayers and, and people in the, and, and working in, the, in various jobs, how they make up songs when they'd be hammering a board, they'd be singing a song as they hammered the nails, crossing Jordan or something like that, you know. And they fill their days doing their work, but everything they did, they associated it with the Lord. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Did you know that? I said, well, you can't do that today. Try it and you'll see. You might be surprised at what you can do. Put off and put on. Now, he gives you two warnings, and I'll close with these. Two strong warnings in the book of Colossians. Very strong and powerful. Chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Colossians 2, 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That word means phileo and sophist means a lover of wisdom. But a philosophy major today is anything but wisdom. <laughs> because it's the wisdom of this world. So he said, beware of philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. So in plainer words, be very careful with the super intellectual elite that appealed to your ego and because you can understand them and appreciate them, you're smarter than the rest of the people. That's the idea. Beware of that crowd that flatters you about how smart you are. You know, and you understand the depths of the spiritual truths that the crowd and the mob could never get a hold of, but you can understand it. So you, you know, you're, you're, you're so blessed. Beware of that crowd. Do you understand that you can read the Bible through intellectually, but you'll never understand, you'll never understand the spiritual truths of it until the Holy Ghost makes it real to you. For the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Therefore, it's this simple. If you're not born again, you can never receive it. You know, I marvel at these documentaries and they get this professor from some theological seminary, this woman from some Bible college, and they're all liberals. And when they start quoting the Bible, they start talking about these stories in the Bible, it's as if they were talking about something they read in, in, in some, just some secular book or magazine. Because there's no soul in it. There's no heart in it. And here's the second warning. This is a powerful warning. Chapter number 2 and verse 18. Let no man beguile you. You remember what the Bible says the serpent did to Eve? He beguiled her. Let no man beguile beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he doesn't understand, puffed up by his, by his, by his, by his earthly mind or his fleshly mind. They say that Colossae had a cult of angel worship located there. That's what they say. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia is a big that they had a cult of angel worship and they had a specific cult there that worshiped Michael, the archangel, Michael. So the apostle is addressing angel worship here in chapter number two, remember? Angels, worshiping of angels. Boy, if you ever lived in a generation that worshiped angels, you live in one today. Don't worship the creature, worship the creator. As high as any creature could possibly be, and an archangel is up there, it's still a creature. Undoubt in my mind. No doubt. If Michael showed up in here tonight, you would be amazed at the glory coming off of that angel. Michael standing here and Gabriel over here, <laughs> the natural inclination would be to do what some of the saints in the Bible did, fall down and worship them. They're so beautiful. Their majestic glory coming out of them. They're still creatures. There's just one Lord God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Worship Him, folks. Worship Him. And there's only one that, all, that knows all, who's omniscient, omnipotent. There's only one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And they deserve worship. I'm not worshiping an angel. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I may wind up doing what Martin Luther did one time, and he picked up an inkwell and threw it at this thing standing at the end of his bed. It wasn't a devil with pitchfork and horns. It was a beautiful creature standing at the end of his bed, appearing as God. Martin Luther threw an inkwell at him and said, Get out of my house. <laughs> sure did. Who's singing tonight? Y'all singing? I kind of figured you would be since so sitting over there.
Let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let us see to it that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news of our departure from the battlefield. Brethren, the devil is trying to put us to sleep. Praise God. Thank you, choir. Thank you, orchestra. God bless you this morning, Times Square Church and those that are visiting with us. Trust that the Lord has already blessed you this morning just by his presence and that your heart is gladdened just knowing that he has everything in his hands. Thank God for that. Thank God with all of our heart. I'd like to speak to you this morning from Psalm 2, please, if you will turn there. Psalm 2, a message that's entitled, Bend, Bow, or Burn. Now, Father, I thank you, God, with all my heart. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. God, I wouldn't even attempt to deliver messages like this unless you had called me to, unless you animate me, give me your heart. Lord God Almighty, I give my body to you and I ask you, Lord, to be the very passion of my heart, the intonation of my voice. Give us the ears to hear what you're speaking to your people in these days in which we're living. These are dark days, but there is a glorious, glorious light on the horizon. Oh God Almighty, help me to do justice to your word today. Father, I thank you for these things, Lord. I bless you, God, for what you will do. Strengthen us, Lord, prepare us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 2, please, beginning at verse 1. I'll read through till verse 5. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Why do the nations rage? The psalmist said. Why do they continuously fall into this cycle of saying, let's put away the testimony of God from within our borders and let's break the cords that have restrained us in a sense from behaving the way fallen people want to behave. There's a certain restriction that comes upon a society when the church of Jesus Christ has occupied her place, has prayed the way she should. We have spoken the words that God's given us to speak it causes a restraint to come into a society. It causes the people of that particular time, place, causes them to have to keep their behaviors in check because the gospel is being preached and the restraining influence of the church of Jesus Christ is in the midst of that society. But there's something in the hearts of fallen men in every generation, ours included. There's this internal rage that says, I will not be under the governorship of God I will not obey God. I will not living, live according to God's ways and his plan for humanity. No, we will cast away these cords as they've done throughout history and we will do what we want to do. We will be God in ourselves and we will decide what is good and what is evil. And we will even create our own utopia at the end of it all, but we will do it our way, not God's way. From the beginning of biblical history, fallen humanity has tried to cast out of its consciousness the knowledge of and the testimony and the presence of God. Folks, it just repeats itself over and over again. Unable to confront the spiritual reality with fallen reasoning and dealing with historical facts that they cannot deny, fallen men usually resort to threats and intimidation. It's always been that way throughout history and it will be that way and is in measure again in our generation. Let me read to you from the book of Acts chapter four, beginning at verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle 
has been done through them, and it's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Now these New Testament threats were nothing new, and they shouldn't catch you and I by surprise in our time. I like to call them the pre-awakening threats of darkness. When God's about to do something, we will have to come up against an opposition that is no different than the opposition that those who have come before us have had to face. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Peter was saying to the people of that time, don't think it's a strange thing. Theologically, we may have produced some kind of a stupor in the modern day testimony in this and other societies that will make it seem as if it's a strange thing when we have to fight opposition to maintaining, retaining, or reclaiming godliness in a nation. Darkness is not going to lay down and go away. God has sent awakenings throughout history, and if we are praying for an awakening, we have to get prepared for the opposition that's going to come. You're going to face it. Some of you are facing it now. And those who aren't, you're going to face it in the very, very near future. When his glory is revealed, when God does that which only God can do, the scripture says you may be glad also with exceeding joy. When you and I have made the choice to stand in the midst of the fire, when we've made the choice to be firm, when everything around us is telling us to bend, when we've made the choice to do right, when society has embraced the concept of doing wrong as if it's a good thing, when sometimes we even have to stand alone in our families, our communities, in our workplace, wherever it is, when you, in your colleges, your classroom, your school, when you simply have to stand alone, but you make the choice to stand. The one thing I know from scripture is God promises to be with you. God promises to walk with you through the flood and through the fire. God promises to close the mouths of lions. God promises to bring you into a supernatural presence of his Holy Spirit in such a measure that you will know that you're being sustained by the hand of God. You think about it for a moment. Had God's people historically bent under the weight of the threatenings, how many wonderful and divine life-changing moments might have been lost. If they had gone home in the book of Acts chapter four and say, well, the authorities are threatening us and they're telling us that we can't preach or teach now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's all just settle for home fellowships. Let's, let's just keep quiet. Let's keep to ourselves. To so think of what would have been lost if that had been their reasonings. But instead of that, it says, they, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth <clears throat> took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. In other words, the society of that day, secular, sacred, those who had some form of profession of walking with God and those who didn't gathered together, unified in this one thing to eradicate the name of Jesus Christ from their society. Verse 28, he says, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. 
Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In other words, we're not going to bend. We're not going to bow. We're not going to back away. But God, we're asking for more of what got us into trouble in the first place. We're asking for more of your presence. We're asking for more power in the truth that you give us to profess. We ask you, Lord, for more healing than just this one man who was lame standing at the gate of the temple. We ask you to stretch out your hand and begin to heal marvelously in our day and in our society. Oh God, do this for the holy namesake of Jesus. And the scripture says, and when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's why on Tuesday night, we're meeting now to pray in this church. That's why we gather at 5.30. At seven o'clock, we go online. 139 countries now potentially involved, either live or throughout the week. People submitting prayer requests. Over 2,000 answers to prayer have already come in. Marvelous, phenomenal answers to prayer. And the cry of my heart is, oh God, stretch out your hand and heal. Stretch out your hand, oh God, and do more than we could even think or ask for. More than we could anticipate. God, think about the threatenings of darkness that are against the testimony of Christ in this generation. I'm not concerned about myself, folks. I am concerned about the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm concerned about the honor of his name. I'm concerned about our children in our streets who've been raised to think there is no God and have an eternity apart from him ahead of them. I'm concerned for the single mother at home crying at night, not knowing where she's going to find the strength to feed and to guide her children. I'm concerned for the honor of God. And it causes me to pray. And it causes me to say, oh God, do what you have to do. Do, Lord Jesus Christ, in my life and in the lives of your people, what needs to be done in this generation that your name might be honored one more time. And when they prayed, the place was shaken because they were sincere. They were not looking for an easy way out. They were not looking for an easy path. They knew that they were praying to be sent into the center of a firestorm. And they knew that only the hand of God would be able to protect them there. Oh God, give us the power again, oh Jesus, to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Give us the power to cast out devils. Give us the power, oh God, as your word says, to be your people, a people like none other. Set apart in the earth as a testimony of the reality of the living God. Oh Jesus, son of God, break the bondages in your house. Those things that have come upon your people and keep us incredibly and incessantly weak. Break these bondages, oh God. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and make us a free people. Turn us away from that which is bringing us into spiritual poverty and blinding our eyes and making us weak and bring us back into that place where we live for the glory of God and for the souls of men. God, touch us in a way like we've never known in this generation. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for what we've done to your name in America. Forgive us for the foolishness that we propagated on this generation, per professing that it was the, glory, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, forgive us for our ways. We humble ourselves and we come before you and we begin to pray. And as you speak, we will turn from our wicked ways and you say you will heal. You will forgive our sin and you will heal our nation. God, we believe it. We stand here in the gap, Lord. And we're not willing to let this country die on our watch. We're not willing to let New York City perish in its sin when you still have a living testimony alive in the midst of this city. If you and I are going to pray, if we're going to continue to believe God for a spiritual awakening in our city and our nation, we can expect opposition. Now the question arises, what kind of opposition can we expect? It'll be nothing new. As Solomon once said, there's nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. Awakenings come, but so do the attempts of darkness to, and the opposition to stop it. So we can expect nothing less than those who've gone before us have experienced. For example, in the book of Exodus chapter one, the people of God, <clears throat> were about to be delivered. They were about to have an awakening of sorts. 
verse eight says, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. In America today, the people who believe in God and believe these are the words of God and at least believe that there are standards in this book which society should live by and this society should seriously consider are more, many more than those who don't. We're right in the same position they were in. So how did darkness oppose these people of God at this time? In verse 10, he says, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happens in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Let's deal shrewdly with them unless they come out from under our control. Oh, folks, we need an awakening. This nation needs to wake up. Most in this nation believe in God. More people go to church or have some form of religious affiliation that don't. And yet a minority of this society are governing us at this time. Therefore, he says, set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities. Now, this is exactly the opposition we're going to face. Here, here it is. We will tell you what you can build. And we will tell you how to build it. And it will have to be built according to our specifications. Now you can go to your house of worship and you can worship, but you're gonna do it our way. And you're gonna build the way we tell you to build. You're not gonna build the way the word of God says to build. You're gonna build the way we tell you to build. In other words, you will bend your will to our will. That is the opposition that we face and will face in the coming days. It is the voice of those who know they are in the minority, but lest we should ever figure out the true power that we have as the church of Jesus Christ. They will come with the threatenings that say, you build our way. And if you don't build our way, it's going to cost you, it's going to hurt you. And then again in the book of Daniel, chapter six, there was a king called Darius of Medo-Persia and all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, keep in mind, most believe that Daniel was strongly influential in the, the eventual king of Medo-Persia issuing a decree to let the people of God go home and begin to build again. But before that awakening came, there came a threatening of darkness against Daniel himself. And basically that threatening of darkness says, we will tell you when you can pray, we'll tell you where you can pray, we'll tell you how to pray, and we'll tell you who you can pray to. And if you don't listen to us, we're gonna devour you. You're going to be devoured. You're going to be cast into a den of lions. And those voices that have been raised against righteousness will defeat you. Again, in Daniel chapter three, there were three young men before Babylon fell to meet of Persia. And in Daniel chapter three, verses three to six, again, <clears throat> it says the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, this is the, the whole more or less people in authority of that time, the judges, the magistrates, all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. In other words, you are going to become one with us and you are going to embrace our new social direction or you are going to burn. We have an image of humankind, we've set that image up, and now we are commanding everyone everywhere to bend and bow. And when you hear the music, you better bow, because if you don't bow, you're gonna burn. 
historically on our part for spiritual freedom to remain, for laws to remain and become just, for the hearts of kings and rulers to be turned back again to truth, for Christ to be glorified again in our day, it will require a people who bend only to the will of God and not to the will of man. That's what it will require. I don't care what kind of a statue the godless of this generation erect and try to get the society to bow down to. God's people must not bow down to it. Oh, the arrogance of humanity to say we can take wrong and make it right. We can redefine the family. We can redefine marriage. We can decide when life should be born and when it should die. All the arrogance of humanity. And they put up their golden statue of themselves and strike up the band and say, now it's commanded to all people of all nations. Now you bend your knee and you worship the way we do and you worship what we do and you worship in the way we worship it. There comes a time in history when men and women of God hold up this book again and say, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. You cannot take evil and call it good. You cannot change the laws of God. You cannot rage against the holy God and say, let us cast off their bands from us. Let us cast away their cords. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh and he shall speak to you in his displeasure and he will have you in utter confusion for that is what awaits those who turn from the ways of God. People who are willing to turn wholeheartedly towards God's truth and prepare to take a spiritual journey. In the days of the Exodus, the word of God came to the people. The word of God looked like it didn't have the upper hand, but somehow in the hearts of God's people, truth found a lodging place and they gathered together around the table in their homes in fellowship and they began to eat of the lamb. They began to partake of the strength that God was willing to provide them. Of course, the whole thing was a type of the cross and of you and I as the church of Jesus Christ today. And they prepared to take a journey into an unfamiliar place. I'm telling you, prepare to take a journey now into an unfamiliar place. The comfort as we've known it is going to be gone. Difficult days are ahead of us as the people of God. But if you will partake of what Jesus Christ bought for you on that cross on Calvary, you gather together as a body in the sweetest fellowship that is known on this side of heaven. You watch what God will begin to do the songs of joy that will come into your heart. He told the people, partake of the lamb, bring in your friends and family together and put shoes on your feet and gird up your loins and get your staff in your hand. We're about to take a journey. It's a journey into a place where natural comforts are gone, where physical comforts are not visible. It's a place where we live by the promises of the word of God. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of comfort. It's a place where there are no signposts, but the presence of God himself. Oh God, thank you for this Lord with all of our hearts for what you're about to do in this generation. Laws will change. Freedom remains. Hearts are turned. Christ is glorified by a people who choose to pray no matter what the laws of men may say. We choose to pray. It is our right to pray. It is still, as far as I know, in the constitution of this country that we can pray. There's nothing forbidding us to pray except a vocal minority that's trying to tell us when and where we can pray and when and where we can't pray. But I can pray anywhere I want to pray. For those who are in school and colleges and the workplace, you can pray walking down the corridor. You can pray shopping for groceries. You can pray on the subway. You can pray sitting at your desk in the world. You can pray anytime you want to pray. You can talk to God whenever you want. And when people ask you what are you doing? You can just say, I'm praying, I'm talking to God. Would you like to join me? Would you like to meet me after school? Would you like to come to my house? Would you like to come to church with me? We pray there. We can pray any time we want. And not only can we pray, God is answering our prayer. God is giving us peace. God is providing for our needs. God is defending us against our enemies. God is giving us strength where we are weak. 
God is bringing us sons and daughters home as we begin to trust him for what only he is capable of doing. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that the true church of Christ will never bend her knee to ungodliness, will never admit to defeat, will never go down into silence. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Spiritual freedom will come. Laws will change. Hearts of even kings and rulers will be turned to truth and Christ will be glorified again. When God has a people who simply refuse to embrace evil and they refuse to call evil good. Uh, firstly, a people who walk out of evil themselves. Get away from these things that are taking your strength. You know what I'm talking about. Those that are listening to me today, get away from the ungodly friendships and relationships and the things that you're reading and seeing and doing and places you're going and you know you shouldn't be going there. It's taking your strength. It's not going to be enough just to come to church Sunday and clap your hands and sing a few sweet songs to get rid of the bad feeling of your week. Those things are not going to cover you. When the Titanic hit the iceberg, you either had God in your life or you didn't have God. No, a people who refuse to embrace evil and call it good. We will never embrace evil in this church. No matter who is trying to call it good, we will never embrace evil. Abortion is wrong. Marriage is between a man and a woman. God ordained it to be so. It is wrong for politicians to lie. It's wrong for them to get up and lie and expect that there's no repercussions from it. It is wrong to do certain things and certain behaviors. It's wrong to mock the name of God. It's wrong. We will never, ever embrace evil and call it good by the grace of God. No matter how many around us are bending when the band plays. It's historically through these types of people that freedom from oppression comes again. Laws change and the hearts of even kings are softened. Remember the prophet Daniel had to go into a lion's den. But listen to what the king said when God delivered him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. This is the type of person. I believe that all people deserve to be respected. I believe that we should treat in this church all people fairly, honestly, and justly. I'm against discrimination in every one of its forms. Every person, no matter how they choose to live, has been created in the image of God, and we are duty bound to honor that. I believe, as the Bible says, that we should pray for kings and all who are in authority. I believe that we must be careful of our speech and we need to pray for our leaders that God would touch their hearts, that they can govern us righteously according to the word of God. I believe that as much as is physically possible, we should be model citizens in the nations, communities, towns that we find ourselves in. I believe that men should stand up and be men of God. I believe that we should be fearless in the face of opposition. I believe this with all of my heart. But I also believe that the word of God is the standard of righteousness and living and truth. It has come out of the mouth of God himself. And I believe it cannot be transgressed without consequence. I also believe that though the nations rage, they are plotting an empty thing. 
Though the kings of the earth set themselves together and rulers take counsel against the Lord and against those that are called by his name. Though they formulate their plans in secret, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away the cords that they're putting on us and causing us to have to restrain our behaviors. I believe that the one who sits in heavens will laugh and have them in confusion. I believe it with all my heart. I believe that God will speak to them and distress them in his deep displeasure. I believe as the end of Psalm 2 says, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, that means embrace the son of God, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But I also believe the last line of Psalm 2 that says, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Oh God, thank you for peace in the midst of the storm. Thank you for being the fourth person in the midst of the fire. Thank you for being the one who shuts the mouths of the lions. Thank you for being the one who gives us the courage, God Almighty, to prepare to take a journey that will bring honor and glory to your name in the earth. God, thank you for these moments in which we're living. Thank you that we are born at such a time as this. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are living at a time exactly as they had to go through, those that have come before us. We're living with these threatenings of darkness coming our way every day and will increase in the days ahead. The freedoms that we have known, you've heard me say this, started saying it five years ago. People would not fully understand then, but more are starting to understand now. The freedoms we have known are now in jeopardy. Laws are going to change for the worse. All it's going to take to make a difference is for God's people to be God's people again. The cry of my heart this week is, oh God, may I be such a person. Will you give me the courage to never bend to man and only to bow to God? No matter the threatenings, give me the courage.